I've asked them to speak for about 10 to 12 minutes max, and then we will have plenty of time for questions. Um, so with that, I'll invite Robert to kick us off. Ruth, thank you very much, Dee. Um, I was sitting <laughs> at the back earlier on, and my main view was at the back of other people's heads. So I think I get to stand up in order to talk. And I thought that before touching on some of the really worrying powers proposed in the bill, I should say something about the broader, broader legislative context. And may I first dismiss the argument that I'm very sorry to say seems to lie at the heart of the government's defence of this bill. It's the assertion that if we don't have this bill, there will be chaos on departure. Of course there will be legislative chaos on departure if nothing were done, but that doesn't mean that this is the way to do it. And I'm sorry that the government has chosen to deploy this somewhat condescending argument. Second, everyone here today can deal with detail, and that's stock in trade for most of us. But getting political traction for what this bill actually does will be made more difficult by the fact that the detail and complexity involved in the bill will be boring to many others. And set against the often simplistic arguments about the principles of Brexit, this will make it more difficult to get real political engagement with the constitutional significance of what the bill seeks to do. Third, there will be the response already deployed by some that trying to make this bill constitutionally acceptable amounts to trying to frustrate Brexit. Alas, the non sequitur there is not as widely evident as it should be. And my last point about the broader context relates to the role of the House of Lords. I said in the latest edition of How Parliament Works, Ruth, you are not the only person who can advertise this morning, um, <laughs> that the Salisbury Convention, properly the Addison Salisbury Convention, is a very dead duck indeed. And not only are the circumstances that gave rise to it now 70 years in the past, but the expectations of the House of Lords, I think, have changed out of all recognition. The idea of rejecting a bill on second or third reading is, frankly, for the birds. But the Lords does fiercely maintain its right to ask the Commons to think again. And it cannot remotely be claimed that the EU withdrawal bill is a manifesto commitment. Its overall aim may be, but that doesn't qualify what this bill does as having been approved by the electorate, even if the government had secured the sort of majority that Mrs May was looking for. It follows that the Lords will, I think, be very confident in asking the Commons to think again, not once, not two, but three, four or more times. And the key issue will be the numbers in the Commons. If the constitutional implications are made sufficiently plain, then successive iterations uh, may well produce different results. In terms of operating the delegated powers proposed in the Bill, it will be very difficult to resolve the tension between time and scrutiny. I've been saying since shortly after the referendum that there'll be a tendency to think of the various subjects of negotiation as capable of being wrapped up in neat parcels to be subject one by one to parliamentary scrutiny. Of course, as we've been seeing over recent weeks, European negotiation has never worked like that. Time and again, agreement in Area A has to wait on agreement in Area Z, which may be wholly unconnected. And this means that the use of the delegated powers in the bill will move well to the right over the two-year period, now, of course, only 17 months. And so the scrutiny task will be commensurately harder. At the same time, there will be the subject bills, which the Queen's speech told us would include immigration, international sanctions, nuclear safeguards, agriculture and fisheries, and we already knew about customs. For the same negotiating reasons, these are likely to be skeleton bills, and we can, I'm sure, look forward, if that is the right phrase, to more rafts of delegated powers. Um, before the publication of the Withdrawal Bill, the Delegated Powers Committee of the House of Lords, of which I'm a member, although of course speaking uh, this morning in an entirely personal capacity, set out some criteria for the bill. The committee said it was vital that the government didn't use it as an excuse to give themselves unfettered powers. Skeleton provision and Henry VIII powers had to be fully justified. The test wasn't just how the present government would use the powers, but also how a different administration might use them, that there should be no provision beyond what was necessary, and I'll come back to that, to ensure that the law works properly the day after exit day, and finally, 
that it would be wholly unacceptable for the Bill to replicate the ECA 72 by giving the Government the choice between affirmatives and negatives. I think the Bill scores very close to naught out of five there. For those not familiar with the work of the Delegated Powers Committee, I should say that for every Bill we seek to answer two questions. First, is the delegation of powers, usually to Ministers, but it can be to other people and bodies, as in this Bill, is the delegation appropriate? And if it is, uh, is the level of parliamentary scrutiny and approval appropriate? Uh, there isn't a, an equivalent committee in the House of Commons. Incidentally, I'm glad that for the first time in the case of the Withdrawal Bill, uh, we in the Delegated Powers Committee will be reporting on a bill when it's in the House of Commons rather than when it arrives in the House of Lords. I'd like to see this happen in every case, and I'm glad to see that it's suggested in the hands of society's excellent publication, Taking Back Control. Now, moving to the powers themselves, the magnificent simplicity of Clause 1, the European Communities Act 1972, is repealed on exit day, is somewhat undermined by the fact that Clause 14 allows the specification of different exit day dates for different purposes, and regulations under Clause 17.5 could make the repeal subject to transitional, transitory, or saving provisions. The specification of exit day or days is subject to no parliamentary procedure. And given the political significance of exit day, this is a rather extraordinary omission. Moreover, because the clauses that time limit the making of regulations under uh, clauses uh, 7, 8 and 9, which I'll come to in a moment, um, are dependent on exit day, it's possible that exit day for that purpose might be much later, thus allowing the clause 7, 8 and 9 powers to be exercised for much longer than the two years which is apparently promised. Moving swiftly on to Clause 7, and I could have paused on some of the worryingly ambiguous drafting in Clauses 3 to 6, the key issue here is the concept of necessity, on which it is clear that the government has changed its position. In the Brexit White Paper, we were told, in paragraph 121, that the bill would not aim to make major, major policy changes beyond those which are necessary to ensure the law continues to function properly from day one. Paragraph 3.7 told us that the bill would provide a power to correct the statute book where necessary to rectify problems occurring as a consequence of leaving the EU. But the criterion for the exercise of powers in Clause 7 is whether a minister considers the provision by regulations is appropriate. And this is a sweeping extension of the powers that the White Paper foresaw. It moves us from technical fitness for purpose into a political arena. And of course, it is extremely difficult to challenge. Whether the drafters are seeking to protect ministers from challenge by way of judicial review, I don't know. But I do not think that this change is at all acceptable, nor that it has been justified. And the same necessary, replaced by appropriate, point arises in clauses 8, 9, and 17. It's also worth noting, as Shona said earlier, that the concept of deficiency in EU law is a novel concept, of course, and defining this somewhat indistinct category is not read, really assisted by the list of overlapping examples in Clause 7.2, especially as they are explicitly not exhaustive. And again, by what standards is the failure of retained EU law to operate effectively to be judged? It's a judgment on which, say, different sectors of the economy might differ quite sharply. But again, it will be for ministers to decide what is appropriate. And I do not think that this is acceptable. A particularly baneful possibility under Clause 7 is the implicit possibility of subdelegation. Regulations under Clause 7 could, I think, allow people or bodies to make further subordinate legislation, that is, tertiary legislation without any parliamentary procedure at all. And I do not think there would even be a requirement for that tertiary legislation <coughs> to be made by statutory instrument. Not obvious on the face of the bill, but rather important is that, as I read it, there are no limits on the scope of that tertiary legislation which escapes parliamentary control entirely and also avoids the two-year time limit applicable to secondary legislation. Clause 7.6 lists constraints 
on, upon ministers in the use of Clause 7 powers that has been referred to already. They may not create a criminal offence punishable by more than two years' imprisonment, but of course they may create not only criminal offences of a lesser character, but also provide for the imposition of unlimited civil penalties. Under Clause 76A, ministers may not impose or increase taxation. Here, the extent of italics in the bill is significant and it deserves to be teased out. Italics in a bill are used to alert the House of Commons, the italics are taken out before the bill arrives in the House of Lords, to provisions that may impose taxes, fees or charges or incur expenditure, subject to a de minimis practice. This bill has two conventional sink provisions, in other words, italicised provisions that normally stand for all the taxation or expenditure in a bill wherever it arises. Uh, the expenditure sink is in clause 12 of this bill, and the fees and charges sink is in schedule 4. So far, so good. But there are also italicised provisions in clause 74 and 75. Clause 8.2, Clause 9.2, Schedule 2, Paragraph 1.3, and Schedule 4, Paragraph 6. Why are these needed in addition to the sinks? I don't know, but I think we should find out. And the clear implication is that certain of the largely untrammeled delegated powers can be used to increase fees and charges and incur substantial expenditure on a scale and in a way which the House of Commons authorities have concluded would not be covered by the sinks. And, of course, Clause 8 regulations are not bound by the constraint on imposing or increasing taxation. Now, just before I have to go and lie down in a darkened room, <laughs> I will end with two particularly unacceptable provisions. The first is the, uh, the ability of ministers, not Parliament, to select whether the affirmative or the negative procedure should apply to the great majority of delegated legislation made under the bill, with the exception of a fairly narrow category of instruments that must be affirmative. And last, there is a whopper of a Henry VIII power in Clause 17. It allows ministers to amend or repeal any legislation ever passed by Parliament from earliest times up to the end of the 2017-19 session. There's no time limit to the making of regulations under Clause 17, unlike the regulation-making powers in Clauses 7 to 9, although I suggested that that time limit might in theory be sidestepped, and regulations under Clause 17.1 would be routinely subject to the negative procedure, thus overturning the normal practice that such instruments should uh, be subject to the affirmative procedure. So, for example, by reason of Clause 17, and paragraph 15.1 and 2 of Schedule 7, ministers could argue that because of the removal of the need for parliamentary legislation to comply with EU law after exit day, they can amend any retained EU law, for instance, on TUPI and working hours. And the constitutional question, as with most of this bill, is, of course, not whether it will be done, but whether it could be done. And His Late Majesty King Henry would, I think, be extremely jealous. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. I think, uh, I think the peers are going to have some fun with this bill when it gets to the, to the House of Lords. Um, right, Mark, your thoughts. Thank you. Well, I may repeat one or two of the points that Lord Lisvane has, has made already, but I think some things are important enough to say twice. Um, I've got three main points about the bill. The first concerns um, what you might call the prima facie scope of the uh, powers. Uh, secondly, I look at other aspects of the bill that take already very broad powers and simply exacerbate the problem. And then thirdly, I'll step back from the detail and ask what the overall effect of the bill is and whether it is constitutionally legitimate. I'll suggest it isn't. Um, as was mentioned, um, I will refer to some of the House of Lords Constitution Committee's work um, on this matter, um, but I'm speaking purely in a personal capacity. As to the scope of the powers, then, the prima facie scope, there are two, I think, vectors that one needs to think about this in terms of. One is the breadth of the powers, and the other is their constitutional depth or potency. And on both of these counts, the bill is unparalleled. Breadth first, then, and here um, I'm some, to, to an extent covering ground that's been mentioned already. The powers are framed in very broad terms. They're, they're framed in subjective terms. There's no reference to the concept of necessity. 
the notion of deficiency isn't defined. The notion of deficiency is enormously elastic to the extent that any guidance at all is given in the bill as to what a deficiency means. Um, it is purely illustrative. And to my mind, the examples, the non-exhaustive examples in the bill simply serve to emphasize the breadth as opposed to the limitation of the powers. It's clear that the powers extend, not as has been suggested by government, to merely technical matters. The notion that this is some kind of technical, legalistic, uh, backroom exercise, but rather it extends to major policy-making initiatives, including the creation of new public authorities and the design of new regulatory schemes. That's explicitly clear from Clause 7.5 of the Bill. And the range of matters that cannot be done using the Clause 7 correction power, um, uncharacteristically for this bill, is drawn not in very generous, but in very, very narrow terms. All of which falls very far short of what the House of Lords Committee called for in its report of March 2017, in which it called for a distinction to be drawn between technical and policy changes. <coughs> Uh, the bill certainly doesn't, I think, uh, recognise uh, that distinction. Now, there is, of course, the possibility that a court faced with powers this extraordinary uh, would look askance at them. And indeed, the Supreme Court last year, in the public law project case, more or less said that the more extraordinarily broadly framed powers in legislation are, the more sceptically the court will have to look at it as a constitutional guardian of the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. So it may be that the courts come in and, to some extent, provide a corrective to the way in which these powers are framed. But, of course, that would be closing the door after the horse had bolted. It's parliamentarians' constitutional duty to solve this problem themselves, not to kick the can down the road. I said there were two vectors as to the scope of the powers. The first is breadth and the second is depth. Not only are these powers extraordinarily broad, but the depth of authority they confer on ministers is uh, similarly um, uh, substantial. So we're told by clause 7.4 and similarly by clauses 8.2 and 9.2 that regulations can make any provision that could be made by Act of Parliament. This is a Henry VIII power obviously. But it's a Henry VIII power to an even greater extent than might first appear, because not only can these powers be used, as Henry VIII powers can, to amend Acts of Parliament, they can, of course, be used to amend the entire body of retained EU law. And an important point to bear in mind is that just as we've been told that the primary secondary distinction doesn't work when EU law comes into UK law, a point with which I disagree, uh, neither does that distinction have any bearing when things are out there in EU law. The point, then, is that there are many things in retained EU law which, whatever we might or might not call them in domestic terms, are the kinds of things that would have been done using primary legislation had their genesis been a domestic one. So this is a Henry VIII power in form and even more so in spirit. So the powers are broad and deep. What about the other aspects of the bill that exacerbate these issues? I'll mention four of them um, briefly. The first has been touched on. That's the issue of sunset clauses. If you're going to confer very, very broad powers, there are a couple of obvious ways of trying to assuage concern. One is to have meaningful scrutiny, as the House of Lords Constitution Committee called for and as the Hansard Society has called for. The bill does not provide for this. It provides no assurance on the scrutiny level. In terms of, I don't mean it doesn't provide for scrutiny, I mean it doesn't provide for meaningful scrutiny. The other way of dealing with the problem is by temporarily limiting the powers, which on the face of it the bill does, but in reality it doesn't. For example, Clause 77 says no regulations under the correction power can be made after the end of a period of two years beginning with exit day. But as we've heard, exit day means whatever ministers say it means. They have a regulation-making power to prescribe exit day. 
And like all regulation-making powers in the Bill, the power can be used to make different provision for different purposes. So, for example, exit day might mean the 29th of March 2019 for the purpose of ECA repeal under Clause 1. It might mean something different, or it might remain entirely unspecified for the purpose of the sunset powers, the sunset clauses. So the sunset period might in fact never begin to run, or at least it does begin to run whenever ministers decide it should. And again, as we've heard, there's no scrutiny by Parliament or control by Parliament at all um, of that matter. Secondly, the bill contains a web of other interlocking provisions that merely serve to exaggerate the breadth of the other powers it confers. Clause 17.1 says that you can use that power to make such provision as is considered appropriate in consequence of this Act. That, to me, seems a very wide power. Schedule 7, paragraph 14 says the fact that a power to make regulations is conferred by this Act doesn't affect the extent of any other power to make regulations under this Act. In other words, we shouldn't expect to find neatly organised powers, but rather a web of overlapping uh, and very broad powers. And clause uh, paragraph 13 of Schedule 7 says that any regulation making power in the Bill can be used to modify retained EU law. So any power in the Bill can be used for that purpose. Moreover, as we've also heard, Clause 9, up until exit day, which of course might remain unspecified for this purpose, can be used to the purpose of amending the bill itself and thereby further expanding the powers conferred by us. The third um, additional aspect of the bill that causes problems is, the, uh, is what lies at its conceptual heart, and this is the notion of retained EU uh, law. Now, the, the difficulties with defining this um, go well beyond the issue of delegated powers. They also raise questions about legal certainty and the impact of the bill on the devolution settlements. But for present purposes, even though the bill can be used to amend any law, not just retained EU law, a perceived ministerial uh, or, or a, a ministerial need that is perceived to uh, correct retained EU law is the trigger condition. And that makes the definition of retained EU law central to the scope of the Clause 7 powers. For a host of reasons that I won't go into now, but I can come back to in the questions if there's interest in this, what retained EU law means is deeply uncertain and highly ambiguous. And then the final aspect of the bill, which is uh, problematic, I think, in this regard, refers to the taxonomical status of retained EU law. Um, and in particular, retain direct EU legislation. So we heard earlier um, from Mr Denman that um, retain direct EU legislation will neither be primary nor secondary legislation, it will be something else entirely. That raises a huge number of, of problems around legal certainty. It raises questions about the relationship between that kind of law and statute law, common law, and the extent to which it can be judicially um, reviewed. It's astonishing, I think, that the bill is silent on this point, except for a reference almost on the final page to the fact that retained direct EU legislation is to be considered primary legislation for the purposes of the Human Rights Act. If, it, if, it, if, it, if it's important to specify what it is for that purpose, it's hard to see why it shouldn't be specified for other purposes. To conclude, then, What's the overall effect of these provisions? The Constitution Committee, in its interim report published last week, said that the bill contains multiple powers which overlap to a very considerable extent and which are not subject to enhanced scrutiny as we recommended. In this way, the bill weaves a tapestry of powers that are breathtaking in terms of both their scope and their potency. The political, legal and constitutional significance of the bill is unparalleled. So where does that leave us? No one's suggesting that Brexit can't be accomplished constitutionally. It would be very naive to suggest that. But it would be equally far-fetched to suggest that the referendum, or indeed the recent election, provides a mandate for this bill in this form, and that to refuse to rubber stamp it is to frustrate the will of the people. I guess there's also the argument that these constitutional principles are all very well, but there's a lot to do in the next 18 months 
then shouldn't we simply get on with it? Isn't the bill simply harnessing the British Constitution's famous pragmatism and flexibility? Well, maybe. But if the UK genuinely has a constitution worth the name, its flexibility cannot be infinite. A constitution isn't something you accommodate when it suits you and dispense with when it proves awkward. The point of constitutions is that they can prove to be awkward. And for all that sophistry might suggest that whatever a par sovereign parliament does is lawful and therefore constitutional, that analysis, I think, is ultimately unpersuasive. This bill is an affront to the sovereignty of Parliament, it eviscerates the separation of powers, and it places the rule of law in jeopardy by compromising the principle of legal certainty. Whatever it says, once it's enacted, will be the law, and it will be lawful, because it will be the product of a sovereign Parliament. Whether it deserves to be called constitutional remains to be seen. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. So um, no doubt where you stand on it. Um, <laughs> at which point I turn to Michael for the perspective from the devolved nations, well, certainly Scotland. Um, it's a long way to shout from Edinburgh. Um, but uh, I, I think it, it would be presumptuous very much for me to talk for the devolved nations. That would be a, just a, a bridge too far. Uh, colleagues in Wales. Uh, and uh, those in Northern Ireland would probably balk at that, uh, to say the least. But um, uh, uh, some of the things which I'm going to say uh, would be uh, applicable uh, in those circumstances too. Uh, and uh, you, can, uh, you can have a, a direct read across in many respects. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, in the, the devolution session this afternoon, what I do not cover uh, will be covered then uh, in respect of... Um, uh, Wales and Northern Ireland and Scotland too. Um, so the uh, Law Society of Scotland has uh, tried to engage in this process for a very long time. Uh, we uh, published documents before the referendum, we commented on the referendum bill, uh, we got to the point of uh, issuing uh, priorities for the UK government's negotiation stance last year. Uh, and we were looking uh, at a range of priorities, some of which uh, are, are uh, visible in this bill. Um, uh, we were talking about uh, ensuring uh, stability in the law, maintaining freedom, justice and security, uh, looking at the mutual recognition and enforcement of citizens' rights, uh, and uh, uh, court cases, including uh, the role of the CJEU and uh, pending cases, uh, looking at promoting the rights of, of EU nationals present in the UK, taking account of the devolved administrations uh, and, in our sense, Scots law in particular in the exit negotiations uh, and uh, uh, seeking then uh, some aspects relating to the legal profession, uh, including, crucially for you, uh, who are potential clients, uh, the continuity of legal professional privilege uh, when we leave uh, the EU uh, because it will be in jeopardy if special provision is not made. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in looking at the bill, uh, we've also uh, issued uh, a briefing to MPs, some of which, uh, like Ruth's um, uh, Hansard uh, uh, report, were referred to in the debate uh, last night. Uh, and, uh, and I think that it's, it's important for um, professional organisations, uh, academics and institutions to participate as much as possible in this process because it is too important, in a sense, to leave to parliamentarians, too important to leave to government. Uh, and uh, it is something which, to uh, manipulate uh, Bernard Jenkins' words, it should be a whole of governance uh, uh, business rather than a whole of government business uh, and by that uh, I would extend to civic society generally uh, to get involved uh, in this process uh, and make their voices heard uh, and the work of the Hansard Society uh, and uh, the Wales Government Centre uh, are clearly uh, examples of how that process is happening uh, just now. So um, looking at uh, the, uh, uh, the way in which the bill uh, touches on uh, devolved administrations. 
We've heard a lot about uh, clauses 7, 8 and 9 this morning, uh, and uh, if one were to flick through the bill um, uh, to uh, uh, schedule, uh, schedule 2, um, uh, then you would find that uh, the provisions relating to uh, ministers in 7, 8 and 9 uh, are replicated to a significant extent in relation to the devolved uh, authorities. And I think that that's uh, quite important because uh, it means that some of the criticisms which are levied in terms of ministerial power making, uh, uh, power taking and uh, uh, the execution of that power uh, will apply not simply to ministers of the Crown but also uh, to uh, Scottish ministers, uh, Government of Wales, uh, Welsh Government ministers and, uh, and uh, in the eventuality that uh, things uh, uh, revive in Northern Ireland uh, the Northern Ireland Executive. Uh, and uh, looking at, at these powers, uh, we have uh, some criticisms which uh, apply to, to all of the, uh, the, the sections, uh, the Clause 7 uh, and Schedule 2 uh, arrangements. We, necess we, we respect uh, and recognise that it's necessary to adapt retained EU law and to enable it to work appropriately in the UK on and after exit date. Uh, and we also uh, uh, think that uh, given the scale of amendments required and the limited time in which to do it, uh, to, confer, to confer wide ranging powers uh, looks to be the only way to do it. But those wide ranging powers obviously have to be conferred with appropriate restraints. Uh, and people talk of Henry VIII's powers. Of course, in a Scottish context, that might not resonate as much as it, it does in this audience. Um, uh, and I've been trying for years to get people to talk about James VI powers, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> one of these days, you know, uh, that, that kind of thing might take off um, uh, and uh, people might respect uh, that kind of concept. Um, uh, but uh, whichever despot you choose, um, uh, and, and, and I, I, I think I would, I would roll back a little, I have to say, uh, from uh, the quotation which Schoenig uh, uh, came away with this morning, referring to the Nazi government. Um, uh, let's not be fooled, ladies and gentlemen. We do not live in a dictatorship. We live in a democracy. Uh, and uh, references of that kind of hyper hyperbole do us no good at all. It is disrespectful to the people who suffered under Nazi Germany for us to liken this process to that process. And I think that it's far better for us to engage in a respectful way without reductionism to that extent and take heed of the things that can be done within the confines of our constitution. Uh, and those things, well, we would, we would take, certainly endorse what uh, the House of Lords Constitution Committee uh, was talking about in its 10th report, uh, and you can see some of that echoed in the uh, report which it has recently issued uh, about making sure that uh, where ministers exercise these powers, they are exercising them uh, on the basis of necessity rather than what is appropriate. What is appropriate to me might not be uh, what is appropriate to Ruth, and what is appropriate to Ruth might not be what is appropriate to Murray Sinclair sitting at the back. Um, uh, and that's important uh, for us to recognise uh, that uh, uh, there, is, there is much more uh, certainty in necessity uh, than there is in appropriateness. We, uh, I think we, we would also, uh, in, uh, in many respects, uh, uh, look forward to uh, the committee stage and inviting the government to be responsive uh, and to be a listening government uh, in terms of amendments which are brought forward. Uh, I'm encouraged, I haven't looked at the, uh, uh, the uh, Parliament website this morning yet, um, uh, but I'm encouraged that there are so many amendments which have been uh, tabled. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly uh, we would intend to send the amendments which we are drafting at the moment uh, to parliamentarians over the course of the next week or so uh, with a, a view to um, elaborating some of the, the, these thoughts about necessity, uh, thoughts about me ensuring that ministers are able to justify uh, the rationale for bringing forward uh, the orders that they uh, intend to bring forward. Um, as I say, Schedule 2 uh, replicates uh, 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 Clause 7, uh, 
8 and 9. Uh, so there are provisions about dealing with deficiencies. Uh, there are provisions about dealing with uh, the, uh, the, the uh, complying with international obligations uh, and for implementing the withdrawal agreement. Uh, but um, uh, it's not just uh, uh, the fact that Schedule 7 uh, is, is important from that point of view, uh, or schedule, schedule 2 is important from that point of view, but Schedule 7 also. Uh, and if one looks at Schedule 7, it, it's uh, uh, um, again uh, the provisions for scrutiny uh, of powers to deal with deficiencies, uh, regulations made by the Minister of the Crown or devolved authority acting alone. Uh, and, uh, those provisions in uh, Schedule 7 uh, are extremely important because uh, the, uh, uh, the schematic uh, for the different arrangements for different purposes applies, and I think there could be uh, some uh, uh, considerable streamlining. Um, uh, we could uh, certainly look at uh, uh, the ways in which the various exceptions apply, uh, uh, and, uh, and I think that that would be uh, useful. There is also an issue about uh, the, uh, in Schedule 7, about scrutiny procedure in urgent cases. Uh, and we haven't reflected on those this morning, uh, but these are where a, a minister is able to come to the House and say, uh, I have uh, urgent uh, uh, provisions which I need to, uh, to ask for power, um, uh, and uh, I'll let you have uh, the instrument uh, after you get, grant me the authority. Uh, it's a uh, trust me, I'm a minister, um, uh, and that's uh, very important for us to be able to trust ministers, but it's a very broad power, uh, and uh, one might imagine that in certain circumstances urgency uh, is uh, needed, uh, but uh, we should actually be thinking about what is the definition of urgency. Um, the, uh, uh, the other provisions which, uh, uh, which apply in terms of um, uh, uh, legislative competence um, uh, are also ones which give us some concern. Um, uh, clause 11, uh, of course, I think will be dealt with later uh, today, uh, but there are provisions in Schedule 2 uh, which touch on um, uh, devolved competence, uh, and there is a definition uh, of devolved competence in uh, Schedule 2 uh, which starts at uh, paragraph uh, 9 uh, on page 19 uh, and ends uh, at paragraph 12 on page 21. Uh, and when one reflects uh, that in the Scotland Act 1998, uh, the definition of devolved competence is contained to uh, one uh, section, uh, section 54, uh, I think uh, one can see that, that uh, uh, there is a question to be asked about uh, why, apart from the fact that this uh, this uh, arrangement tries to cover all the devolved uh, powers uh, uh, and uh, devolved authorities, why it has to be the case uh, that the definition of devolved competence in one act is not good enough for this one. Thinking about what the Scottish Parliament will have to do very quickly uh, in dealing with this, um, uh, Scottish uh, statutory instruments uh, are a particular type of subordinate legislation. There is one uh, delegated powers and law reform committee uh, which deals with these uh, on a technical basis uh, and uh, the policy issues uh, are fed out to what are known as the lead committees, the other 14 committees. Um, uh, of the Scottish Parliament, everything from justice, health and sport uh, to finance and constitution, uh, you can find uh, these orders cropping up there. Uh, and uh, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has recently uh, issued a call for evidence in, in terms of the bill, which I know uh, that uh, uh, Scottish uh, uh, actors in, and those who are interested in this will be responding to, uh, but uh, I would encourage anyone uh, who has an interest in this uh, to take a look at that uh, uh, call for evidence and, if possible, um, answer it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. So uh, we have plenty of time for questions. I'm going to take them in groups of two or three um, and then take them back to the panel. If you have a question, can I ask you to, if you're representing an organisation or whatever, can you identify that um, with your question? It'll just be interesting for everybody to know who's asking the question, what your interests are, etc. So, uh, okay, who would like to ask a question? 
They've stunned you all into silence. Fantastic. OK, we've got a gentleman here. Anybody else? Can I see any more? There's one here and one at the back. OK, so gentleman first. OK. Um, wouldn't you say this is one of the cases where the ends justify the means? And uh, that both major political parties, the Conservatives and the Labour Party, would love the amb ambiguity. Uh, Conservatives just to get the job done, and the Labour Labour Party then they will foster a sense of grievance for the next uh, general election. Okay, and are you representing anybody no. in particular? No, just just interested <laughs> member of the public. Great, gentleman here. My previous director, Professor Elliot, would it be fair to characterise your critique of the bill as saying that uh, it is uh, beyond the amendment and it can only be cured by shooting it? It's so deep, it's so extensive. Okay, great. And I do know the gentleman here is a retired civil servant. And retired you're a retired civil servant? servant? I don't represent anyone other than myself. Yeah, great. And the gentleman that was behind, yeah. Uh, Giffen, we switch to go in Wales. Um, uh, just wondering on the devolved question whether anyone has a comment on the fact that any government are saying that virtually all the powers that are given to devolved ministers are given concurrently to ministers of the Crown. Uh, it, it, it seems to me very likely. I mean, what happens if both sets of ministers set about collecting the same piece of legislation? Uh, and will they have any comments on, on the interaction between those parallel powers that are given to two different sets of ministers? Article, of course, to two different sets of legislatures. Okay, I'm going to go to Mark first. This is one particular one for you, and then we'll open it up. So. Thank you. So, my question was is, is the bill beyond amendment? Should it be taken out and shot now? Um, I think there are, well, let me preface this by saying that I have um, no doubt that drafting this bill has been extraordinarily difficult. Um, let me also preface it by saying that I think there are, there are two sets of concerns that one might have. One set of concerns are policy concerns, and they, I think, are the concerns that MPs were focusing on primarily in the debates um, over the last week in the House of Commons. And I, I, I think that those concerns can be addressed through amendments. Um, I think, personally, if the uh, particular the scrutiny and the limitation of the powers is to be adequately addressed, the amendments will need to be uh, substantial. Uh, but I see no obstacle, if the political will is there, to making those kinds of amendments. And, and, and they are policy judgments about where the right balance lies between getting things done and exercising meaningful um, control. Uh, I actually uh, have a, a further set of concerns which, which are far less readily um, presentable to um, sort of the general public, as it were, around the questions of conceptual coherence and legal certainty, some of which I hinted at in my um, comments um, earlier. Um, and, and I do think, um, I, would, I certainly wouldn't go as far as to that the bill uh, is unrescuable, but I do think that there is some serious work to be done at the conceptual core of the bill in terms of the notion of retained EU law, what it is, how far it extends, what its legal status is, how the principle of the supremacy of EU law operates after exit day, and whether in fact that principle can operate at all if the bill excises EU law from the domestic statute book. Um, that's a set of concerns which is far less easy to explain in terms of a power grab, but I think it actually presents the greater uh, difficulty in one sense. When we think of this bill, as it, it really is, as a mini constitution is going to serve as the basis for a post-exit um, legal system. Great, thank you. Robert? Um, to take the, uh, the question about should it be shot, um, uh, I think if there were no um, constitutional inhibition on the House of Lords, uh, it would probably fail at second reading in that House by an extremely large majority, that's my, my guess. But obviously, that's not the world in which we live. Um, I did touch on the likelihood of extended exchanges between the two houses, and I think that is likely to happen. But I think that Mark has absolutely put his finger on the point when he talks about conceptual coherence. 
because it is so much easier to take a spanner to the provisions, particularly, I mean, let's, let's take clause 7 as an example. But then dealing with the broader coherence and the nature of EU retained law and what deficiencies are and how they're to be identified, that's much more difficult, I think. And because the thing is so seismic, uh, the effect on legal certainty and the rule of law really runs through the entire bill. And it's much harder, I think, to get a handle on that and to deal with it. And if I could answer the question that came from the front, I think you're making my case for me if you say that the two major parties have a big political, uh, as it were, um, present to be unwrapped from this bill. That's the worry, that dealing with these really vital constitutional issues may get overlain with um, a pretty unsophisticated argument about Brexit. I mean, this is really, it is about Brexit, that's the stage on which it's happening, but it is about our constitutional certainty and what we're left with to operate over the next decades. Michael? Well, um, uh, I suppose the problem is, isn't it, that uh, we're uh, trying to shoehorn uh, this massive transfer of, of uh, laws uh, into uh, procedures which are not suited for that kind of operation. Um, uh, if uh, there are two thoughts which, which come to mind. First is that, that um, if one were to look at uh, legislation which created a, an, a, an independent state uh, from a former colony, uh, you would invariably find that the first section uh, of, let's say, the Nigeria Act or the Jamaica Act would effectively say uh, that the, all the law which applied uh, on the day before independence would apply after the day uh, uh, of independence, uh, and, and, and on the day of independence. And so therefore, uh, uh, in those days, there was a unique simplicity uh, about being able to do that. But this is uh, the deconstruction of a supranational legal order uh, and its transposition into the national legal order. It is a remarkable and unprecedented project in modern times. Uh, and I think, um, a, a, I've said before, it's unprecedented. Uh, some would say it's even a golden age of law reform and policy development, um, uh, uh, particularly uh, those who may, uh, may seek to advise uh, on uh, the consequences of this uh, in the future. Uh, but uh, the, the important thing is that our parliamentary processes uh, are not fitted for that kind uh, of operation. Uh, and uh, the constraint of either a negative or affirmative resolution procedure uh, in, in uh, the, uh, the bill uh, is one which needs to be reflected upon uh, and, and I hope that the government will reflect on that uh, and allow for uh, a, a, a wider operation uh, of consultation uh, and debate uh, on uh, those issues which are of the most significant controversy uh, as we go forward. Uh, and that means uh, that for those issues which are not of significant controversy, uh, just now, uh, government could start the process of rolling out draft orders uh, where we know uh, these have been reflected on, uh, and uh, indeed uh, uh, Daniel Denham this morning uh, was indicating that, that a lot of this work has been done, um, uh, uh, and although uh, he wasn't prepared to go into the more controversial ones, we know that the, the uncontroversial ones uh, look like I think in the bag, maybe, well, let's see, uh, but why not start consulting now? If we wait until Royal Assent, that could be March of next year, April of next year, Ooh, just be away for Easter holidays. Um, uh, and uh, then uh, there is this gallop towards March of 29. Oh, but will it be March of 29 or will it be the Intergovernmental Conference in October 18 that will be the deadline uh, of getting things sorted? Uh, so I think that we've got to be, uh, be uh, wise to, to the fact that our procedures don't allow it. We've got to think about how to make our procedures allow it, and we've got to be flexible. 
Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm just saying that that mammoth 59 pages of amendments, there is one that has gone down, I think from Chris Leslie, suggesting that the government should come forward within one month of royal assent with proposals for reform of the scrutiny procedures in the House of Commons for all these statutory instruments that are going to come forward. But it's still going to, that, that in itself would seem to me to delay the, uh, delay the, <laughs> delay the debate a bit too long. Um, am I right in saying, Michael, that there is no strengthened scrutiny model in Scotland, possibly not either in, in the National Assembly for Wales either, Please, in well. the way that the House of Lords has insisted on strengthened scrutiny measures for wide Henry VIII powers in previous bills? Uh, well, um, the, the super affirmative procedure which uh, uh, under the Legislative right. uh, uh, and Regulatory Reform Act uh, 2006, uh, is the, instead in Scotland there, there is an, a, a super affirmative procedure which allows for consultation but not for amendment, I think, I think that's right. Um, and SSI's Scottish statutory instruments um, are uh, uh, first and foremost uh, allowed to be uh, uh, under negative resolution procedure, affirmative resolution procedure. Some only have to be laid um, uh, and some uh, are, are subject to uh, this um, uh, consultation period, uh, which uh, equates with a kind of super affirmative, but not in the same sense as in uh, the UK Parliament. Okay. Right, another round of questions. Yep. Shantan at the back. Any more? My name's Carl Harvey. Okay. University of Belfast. And sure. just following on from the theme mentioned, but there seems to be a sort of paradigm emerging to oh, the technical fix paradigm of all this. And the one I think that we probably at this panel it was moving the conversation on to which are the larger constitutional questions that this is all raising. It seems to me what, what we're having is a constitutional conversation about the nature of the constitution of the UK today. And that needs to be had. I think it's important that we, that we shift that debate. It's what seems remarkably absent, and this may be coming out of the Northern Ireland experience we'll speak to later is the remarkable absence of proactive and explicit constitutional principle in the debate, but also um, thinking about the role of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and at this point, the notion of safeguards, safeguards around the rule of parliament, around the rule of law, and also fundamentally around the rule of human rights. But I suppose the question to the panel is we Rather than having a conversation about technical fixes, which I know is a necessary conversation, aren't we really having a constitutional conversation about the constitution of the UK? Question mark. Okay. Any other questions? For no. We'll go. <coughs> okay, Robert. Do you want to? Well, I think it's a very good point. Um, yes, I think we are, and uh, it's a classic sort of human reaction. Uh, you know, you 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 don't notice the village green for 40 years and then somebody suggests um, fencing it off or moving the cricket pavilion and then there's outrage and everybody starts realising how very good the village green was as it was before. So I think there is an element certainly of, as it were, testing the constitutionality and we don't have really a concept of constitutionality in this country but people do understand what they expect the constitution to do for them. And the Constitution, or perhaps one should say our constitutional arrangements, because we don't have a Constitution, uh, needs to be treated with respect and a certain degree of gentleness if it's actually going to work. Now, this bill uh, does not treat it with respect and it does not treat it gently. <coughs> and I think that is certainly the basis for the sort of conversation that you want to see. Um, and it may be, too, that it is something, I mean, that would be great if some of these rather anoraki bits of the bill uh, gained a, a wider currency. I mean, so it was earlier on the quotation of somebody saying, what is it about these Henry VIII powers? Now, if there were more people saying that, and if indeed the Constitution Committee and the Lords and uh, PACAC in the Commons, and I would say also the Delegated Powers Committee, worked on the basis of giving examples, not just saying this is this power, can be used subject to these constraints or, or whatever. But to say this power could be used to do this, and there were, um, there were a compendium of examples 
of what could actually be done under this bill, then I think that would make the political consideration, it would join up, the, in a sense, the mechanics with the political implications of, that they have. Um, I, I agree with the premise of Colin's question, and I uh, was also struck by what Lord Lisbon said about the lack of a notion of constitutionality. Um, it's probably clear from what I said in my talk that I do have a sense of constitutionality, which I think is breached by this bill. Um, and without taking the, the, the mood of the room for granted, I would suspect that whether we agree or disagree on the conclusion, there is probably in a, in a room consisting of an audience like this a far greater sense of the proper boundaries of constitutional conducts than there might be um, if you just uh, sampled a cross-section of the, the public. And I think that one issue that really highlights is that in our polity, uh, there is, in a sense, an, an, an elite understanding of constitutionalism, but there is perhaps a, a lack of popular understanding and consensus in the way that you get Say, for example, in the USA, where there is a text to which you can refer and which uh, people are actually taught about and educated about. And the risk, I think, is that you end up with uh, a very small group of people talking to each other and you end up with the general public looking on from the outside, not necessarily entirely sure um, what um, all the fuss is about. And that works to an extent as long as the elite that talk to each other and interact with each other understands the rules of the game, act in good faith, and acknowledges that there may be unwritten constraints on what can be done, but they're constraints nonetheless. And I think what this bill does is to test that informal, organic consensus. And I think it places it under quite a high degree of strain. Of course, in Scotland, I think it's fair to say we might come from a slightly different place. And, uh, and we come from a different place uh, because uh, the union with England uh, is on the basis of the Treaty of Union, which is, uh, in a sense, uh, the, the, the basic law which underpins uh, our relationship within the UK. Uh, and the two acts, the Union with England Act and the Union with Scotland Act, um, uh, uh, create that uh, entity of Great Britain, um, uh, uh, and I think that uh, then uh, when one adds, and I think this holds true for Wales and Northern Ireland too, uh, the, uh, the rolling programme of devolution within the context of the Scotland Act was amended, uh, Scotland Act 1998, amended in 2012 and amended in 2016, you can see the beginnings of something which looks like uh, a constitution uh, for a devolved administration, and I think that that uh, we, we come at it perhaps from a different place. And I think engagement with the public, engagement with those who uh, may only talk of Henry VIII uh, in terms of a once <coughs> popular song, um, which hardly anyone in this room will remember the words to, um, uh, but um, uh, uh, changes when they see the direct relevance of the constitutional issue before them, as they did during the course of the Scottish independence referendum in 2014. Uh, and uh, so I think that that's, that's quite important because that energised uh, Scottish uh, uh, um, public discourse. It energised uh, the debate amongst the public uh, to such an extent that issues about um, uh, the relationship between uh, Scotland and the rest of the UK Scotland and the EU were part and part of common debate. Uh, and I think that that's where, in a sense, looking at uh, the, uh, the referendum on uh, EU membership um, uh, and then translating it into uh, this document, uh, there is a risk that the public will not be talking about the EU withdrawal bill uh, at the bus stops uh, in Clapham this morning. Uh, but they might be talking about the way in which Keir Starmer talked to uh, David Davis uh, or Dominic Grieve talked to uh, uh, David Davis, but they won't be talking about uh, the actual uh, business of the bill. And that's where everyone in uh, civic society has an obligation to try to energise the debate and make people uh, understand what's going on. Okay, uh, we have time for a few more questions. Yes, gentlemen here. 
Oh, now we've suddenly got a rush on. <laughs> gentleman here, gentleman there, and lady back there. And we will, if you can keep them short and sweet and the answer's the same, we will try and get the other two in as well. I found Lord Lisbeth's suggestion of uh, a body producing a report which shows how the powers could be used. If that was produced by a body with a sufficient authority and produced in a way which didn't exaggerate but showed exactly the kind of things that might be done, it could turn the debate. Which body might produce such a document? Could it be the House of Lords Constitution Committee? Or does there have to be an alternative? And indeed, might there be more than one such body? OK. And gentlemen there. I'm very glad I used to work for European bodies. The um, question to Pan Reddy is Article 50, the two year time limit. In view of all the, the prospect of a botched job due to the haste that this withdrawal bill seems to present, um, could the government consider now the alternative of asking the other 27 countries for an extension of time necessary to avoid <laughs> the actual problems we've done? Okay, and the lady. Today, yeah. Thanks, I'm Lara, and I'm from the Commons Library. Um, partly to make sure that not all the questions are asked by men. Um, but, um, I just wanted to um, ask if anyone wanted to comment on today's motion about um, the makeup of the Commons um, legislative committees. Okay. Um, Robert. <laughs> Good heavens, is that the time? <laughs> <laughs> Um, first question, um, are there bodies? Well, I think um, uh, we are in a position to feed those thoughts through to the Lord's Constitution Committee and to the Lord's Delegated Powers Committee. Um, the, the second, uh, do we have enough time? Will it be a botched job? I think that's inevitable. Getting more time, extremely difficult. We may have to live with the consequences. That worries me. Uh, third question, um, I think uh, it... <laughs> um, uh, I, I've moved on from those, those Elysian fields down at the other end of the, the building, um, but I think that it'll get a rough ride and a jolly good thing too. Okay. You, anything you want to add? If not, I'll go to the, to the other questions. Well, I, I think uh, the idea of having an extension to the negotiation period at this moment uh, is forlorn, uh, because if, the, if it were granted, there would be no imperative to continue. <laughs> <laughs> at the same speed, uh, and uh, uh, so therefore uh, it, it will be in everyone's interest to maintain that dead drop period uh, ending on the 29th of March, uh, because that is what drives the negotiation uh, and expect an 11th hour uh, discussion where it all comes together. There were two more questions over there, not far from Arabella, so I'll take those two and then we will wrap up. So yeah, the gentleman there. It's more a, a, a statement, actually, but I'll, I'll couch it as a question. Quick, then. To the, to the <laughs> panel, not think, um, that to use these niceties of uh, law and the Constitution now uh, is uh, a little, um, I, I won't use it, 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 hypocrisy, a little bit of hypocrisy, uh, when they were quite happy to stand aside uh, and let a thousand years of British evolutionary law uh, uh, be superseded, replaced, uh, and made subordinate to European law without reference at all to the Parliament. Now, we know the niceties of law, uh, of the law says that this is a different situation, but the truth of the matter is powers were handed to the European Parliament without the scrutiny of the British Parliament. Okay, and there was one other question, if you yeah, jump on that. Uh, yeah, I'm Adam Beckett, I'm a journalist from Business Insider. Um, this is for Professor Elliot, really. If there are conceptual problems uh, at, the, at the heart of the bill um, and that can't be solved by amendments, how can they be solved? And is it a disaster that, they, that the bill is passed to some well, well on, on that point, um, I don't think I meant to suggest that, that the bill couldn't be amended so as to address these points. I think the point I was making, and I think the point that Lord Lisbane was making as well, is that, um, is that this doesn't involve any tinkering, that because it involves concepts that are sort of deep within the bill, it would require um, 
significant amendment and significant intellectual um, energy to be spent on addressing those those issues. I don't think that you can't amend these problems away, but I think that it's a, it's, it's a deep uh, kind of amendment that goes to the heart of how the bill works. Michael. Ruth, I'd love to say I was a kind of legislative anorak, but when I was 11, I was reading the European Communities Act of 1972. But I wasn't. But I know for sure that Parliament debated that uh, bill which led to that act extensively. Uh, and furthermore, uh, that when uh, we arranged to send uh, uh, um, uh, commissioners to the Commission, uh, they represented the United Kingdom's interests throughout the period uh, of our membership of the European Union and today, uh, and that MEPs have been elected in this country to participate in that legislative process. So I think it's, it's pushing the envelope to say uh, that we have had no democratic engagement uh, in the creation of EU law, uh, and as far as I remember, I was slightly older, that uh, there was a referendum about remaining within the EU, which the UK agreed to. Okay, and Robert. Um, well, I arrived at the House um, shortly after the uh, European Communities Bill was passed, um, but it, it went for day after day after day after day in committee of the whole House, um, and uh, the, the House also set up a European legislation scrutiny process, which had its disadvantages, but at least it was a response to the requirement, and I think the, the big difference is that under that whatever view you take, and you take a pretty unforgiving view of what was done in 1972, uh, the difference between that and what we've got in front of us now is that the, what, the, uh, what was coming through from the European, uh, from the EEC and then the EU had been subject to a process of scrutiny and legislation. And we're talking about something that starts from zero. And you may think, and you're shaking your head at me, and I'm sure that that indicates you don't think the process was uh, exacting enough, but nevertheless, that is the formal position. Okay, and on that score, I'm really sorry, we, we will run out of time. Um, can I ask you in a moment to thank our panel?